and things which are several hundred dollars or over a thousand dollars a pound, that's what they should be collecting because that's the stuff that they won't be able to buy. Now, with GNR and other projects, we've planted virtually every month of the year, but I still maintain that if you can plant in late fall, and I have a lot of managers now that love to plant in snow because they use the broadcast cedar, it doesn't um, discriminate against the really fine seed species that need light to germinate, the seed frost seeds. And one of the hard things about using the broadcast seeding is knowing where you've been. If you're doing it on snow, you can see your spread rate and you can see where the tractor's been. So it's very helpful. And so some managers now will only plant on snow, mostly for those reasons. They could plant earlier, but it's just easier. Plus, this guy can hit the uh, one differential break on the tractor and spin it 360 degrees. You can't do that with a seed drill. Also, and this is the hardest part, I don't expect very many people to follow this because it's very difficult, and that is the supply of your rarest seed should determine how many acres you plant. It is very difficult because oftentimes, especially with uh, institutional plantings or government plantings, your sharecropper wants to get out of the business, suddenly you got 50 acres to plant. If you can divide that up into smaller units, it's very helpful because volunteers we collected over a quart of flock seed and we spread it, we kept it on 13 acres. And by the second year, it's blooming really nicely. But if we had 50 acres, it would be just diluting it. And again, if you were doing a study, it would just become totally improbable that that particular plant would show up in your database. Plant more forbs, less grass. Um, there are some problems with Certain forb plantings getting overrun with Canada goldenrod. Um, that can be controlled by timely mowing. But I would rather have the goldenrod in there than solid big blue stem. It's doing a much better job for your monarch butterflies and your pollinators than big blue ever will. You'll get other species like the purple fringed orchid colonizing this. But once you've overplanted with the grasses, and it's not that it's not that the grasses are naturally kind of aggressive, really. If you go out on native prairie, um, the seed production of grasses is fairly conservative. If you hand pick the stuff, um, you know, some years that the PLS might be less than 10%. In some cases, little blue stem completely shuts down production, but you can't tell unless you pinch that hull and see if there's a real kernel in there. But what we do is we grow these things, they're easy to machine, harvest, clean, and we concentrate them into huge amounts and dump them over in quantities that far exceed what they're seeding in on the native bird. Um, so plant as many forbs as possible. Oh, and incidentally, that was a, a uh, rusty patch bumblebee that my wife found. And he really liked culver's root, so if you want to help that species out, plant a lot of culver's root. And again, this is a very hard thing to do. Use le local remnants as models for your seed mixes. Now, obviously, this sort of mix with all these spring species would be very expensive. But when we talk about our prairies declining in diversity or not replicating this, it's a function of how much this costs. But over time, these prairies have changed very little. When Madison Audubon took over the uh, management of this, after a few burns, this community completely restored itself. And, you know, I bet it's probably looked like that for centuries. I don't think it's very, just like the Crane Foundation plantings that haven't changed much over time. If your planting is modeled after your local remnant associations, I think you'll have a much better longevity than a commercial mix that combines the cheapest stuff from all over the Midwest and puts them in a situation that they're not used to. You know, your soil type is different, your adaptability is different, and they're probably a combination of species that really are maybe even found in your area. Lastly, consider a variety of management options. So if you're always burning in the spring, consider a fall burn. Fall burns are very nice for spring blooming species. Um, grazing is very difficult to manage. 
but that's another possibility if you've got too much tall grass to introduce some grazing and then interseed. Um, if we can't burn, we mow if possible. And I know that's difficult on rocky ground. I've broken many mower blades, uh, but um, sometimes you have to do that. In fact, I'm thinking that um, with burning, the burn crews are so spread out. We've got so much area to burn that in the spring there are probably two days where everybody should burn their prairie and then all the spring flora would be just fine. But usually I get a call for burning and my shooting stars are already in bloom and I'm thinking they must either not have any spring flora or they've burned them all out. So that's it. I will be here for the entire conference if you have questions. But I hope that gives you something to think about. We have time for maybe one or two questions. Also, we need to get the dishes up here for people for catering, so you can take care of that. So, do we have a question? Yeah. We were talking about how sometimes seed won't grow if it's from an isolated population unless it's crop pollinators. With that in mind, would you be cautious about using going out there collecting certain species? Like maybe rather buy those from a vendor who's growing their plots there? Um, the question is um, about um, seed collection on local remnants with regard to inbreeding. And um, I think the thing is that you want to select a range that's acceptable for local genotype, and I think that's about 50 miles. If you can find remnants within that and collect from a variety of those sites, that would help. I think the tendency has been to always raid the same areas over again, particularly with those super cautious about using local genotype. But I think um, the inbreeding depression has been kind of underestimated. I don't think there's probably a long-term problem with collecting off the same sites um, in that regard. But, and it could be that if the population is healthy enough, if there are many individuals, that inbreeding may not be an issue. It's just that for some species, particularly like some orchids that are very rare and suddenly isolated by land use, that, that would be something I would definitely want to hand pollinate. One more question? Oh, here we go. Here. Yeah, I uh, Mike Mailing uh, says, please comment on transline tolerant mixes and spike seeding into problem areas to control invasives such as thistle. Good question. I actually on my farm, I almost use no herbicide whatsoever. But um, what we found is most effective actually is the timing of the mowing, because. One of the problems, yeah, with herbicide is you always have collateral damage. And if you have a bunch of seedlings that you're not recognizing, those could be damaged too. So what we try to do, we use a number of techniques. Um, if the mower doesn't handle it, we've used a flame weeder. If, uh, that's really good if you've got a problem with uh, the Dutch white and red clovers. Um, but thistles, in general, I don't worry too much about because after a period of time, they should be out-competed. Now, it could be on some really compact soils. I've seen problems with Canada thistle. I think it really likes compacted soil. But ultimately, that root is fairly close to the surface. And I used to think, or we were told, to go and herbicide thistle, go and uh, mow it. But I think that was essentially actually just encouraging it because as long as we were keep opening up some disturbance for it, it persisted. Where I said, to heck with it, stop mowing it, the native grass has actually outcompeted it. And so I think with the thistle, it's a problem of, oh my God, that's a thistle and it's a noxious weed. So people are, it's sort of mandated that we get rid of it. But I, ironically, um, it's the disturbance that I think perpetuates it, and if you have enough patience, then 
if you've got a good planting seeding rate, that eventually it should be all completed. Very good. Thank you, Scott. That was really a great talk. Really appreciate it.